Hi everybody. This is going to be a fluff reading of the for the and an interview for the Imperial Knights article that came out in the latest White Dwarf. It's going to be mixing a little bit of the background story of the Imperial Knights along with interviews of the original uh, model makers for it. <clears throat> Hopefully one of their next updates will be Imperial Robots. That's almost going to be a certainty then. So let's get started. The Imperial Knights. Long before the rise of the Emperor and the birth of the Imperium, humanity reached out to the stars, eager to occupy new worlds and expand its burgeoning empire. Vast colonization ships carried eager settlers along with all the resources they might require and landed on far-flung, often isolated worlds. The descendants of these pioneers are found in the nightly houses of the Imperial Knights. Uh, that's, that's great writing, writing. The nightly houses of the Imperial Knights. <clears throat> A faction unlike any other in the universe of Warhammer 40,000. Many years ago, we introduced the Imperial Knights in the classic game Adeptus Titanicus, says Jarvis Johnson, his deep Saronis voice filling the White Dwarf hobby rooms as he speaks. This was a long time ago, 1990 or so, and the Imperial Knights were an expansion to the existing Titan legions that existed in epic scale. The idea was that they were war machines piloted by a single warrior. So, we wove them into the narrative of the universe at that time. They were warriors from isolated worlds and from a culture that predated the Imperium. We knew precious little else about them at that point, save that we could save what we could convey through Jess Goodwin's miniatures and snippets in White Dwarf articles. Although we made various models for them around that time, they lay in the shadows of the Warhammer 40,000's background. Perhaps fittingly, just like the night worlds themselves, they remained isolated and alone for a long time. In all the years since years of silence since, we, in the design studio, never forgot about Imperial Knights. They waited, enshrined in the background of our beloved universe. <clears throat> for the right time to return, Jarvis added. The new Imperial Knight miniature is the perfect chance to really show what the Imperial Knights are all about. Just as Jess and the miniature designers have returned to the first principles of the Paladin miniature. We have also returned to the original source material for their background. <clears throat> The Imperial Knights are characterized by their independence, Jarvis says. They are bound to the Imperium and the Adeptus Mechanicus by oaths of fealty, but they are not subjects in any true sense of the word. Their culture and society predates the Imperium by thousands of years, way back before the Dark Age of Technology, and it is informed far more by the bonds between a noble pilot and his knight suit than any outside influence. Theirs is a culture of relentless, formalized ritual. It is a society that exists without the stultifying observance of apparently pointless ceremony and endless courtless mundanity. Against this tableau of formalized ritual are the noble pilots, Jarvis says. They are a breed of warrior who find their only joy in battle, and they yearn constantly to escape the oppressive dullness of courtly life and ride their night suits to war. The thrill of battle and the risk of death is an infinitely preferable experience for them to the monotony of life within their fortresses. These are warriors born to their calling, raised for nothing other than war, they spend every moment they can preparing, training, and planning for battle. The alternative is simply too dull for them to even contemplate. <clears throat> the Nightly Houses 
Imperial knights belong to knightly houses. Dynasties of nobility evolved from the need to protect the early human settlers from indigenous species discovered on alien worlds, says Jarvis. The formal role of protector and castalian developed over time into the structure of noble houses that was old when the Imperium was in its infancy. The curious fact that the night houses are often uncannily alike, despite their far-flung nature, is explained, at least in part, by the union of Noble Pilot and his suit of night armor, known as the Ritual of Becoming. He continues, connecting, a neuro connecting at a neural level with the war spirit of a suit of night armor has a profound effect on the consciousness of the pilot. The joining of mind and war spirit has helped to create cultures which appear uncannily familiar despite evolving on worlds that are far apart and have never shared formal communication. Creating the machine. While other hands also shared the work on the Imperial Knight, for Jess Goodwin, working on the miniature has been a surprisingly long journey. Creating an Imperial Knight for Warhammer 40,000 is the realization of a long-held dream, Jess says, by way of introduction. The model is descended from the Imperial Knight Paladin I sculpted for Adeptus Titanicus more than 20 years ago. And since then, I have wanted to bring the same styling and ideas to Warhammer 40,000. But we've never truly had the opportunity or resource to create a fitting miniature. Even back then, and in the tiny scale in which we made epic models, the paladin had a very distinctive design, a beetle-back carapace with a head sunk deep between the shoulders, weaponized arms set beneath large curved shoulder pads. It's a theme we've seen on the Reaver and Warlord Titans too, a design that speaks to common origins and a unified design ethos. In some ways, returning to the Imperial Knights seems a little bit more like an archaeological exercise, Jess quips. We have enjoyed unearthing it. It is a miniature rooted in the ideas and designs of the past, and many of the things you can see on the model are informed not only in its diminutive predecessors, but also by the background that places it squarely in the Warhammer 40,000 universe. The early history of the Imperial Knights mentioned how they were originally built with the intention of helping with the work of colonization, says Jess. This inherent practicality is communicated in many of the aspects of their design. The Reaper Chainsword, considered such a fearsome weapon on the battlefield, was clearly once intended for clearing large areas of vegetation for the early settlers. Each of the weapons has heavy-duty lifting hooks attached to it, and you can imagine the practical colonists hooking up or digging or lifting apparatus just as easily as you can punk picture them drawing powerful battle cannon out of stores to fend off marauding orcs or Eldar. Many of the practical considerations of this model are now hidden under the sloped armor plates and heraldry of the Imperial Knight, but we were conscious to design a miniature which connected with the stories behind the model. If you were to leave the armor plates off of your model, you would have a war machine that resembled the functional construction machines of the past. We also wanted to give a sense of narrative to the miniatures that people would be able to identify with, Jess added. We imagined that the parts of a suit of night armor were forged by the artisans, they spell this, <laughs> I believe that's artisans, I don't know what that word is, sworn to the knightly orders. As you look at the large armor plates, it's easy to imagine menials pouring molten metal into massive sand casts, the raw practicality of the task at odds with the ritual and dogma of creation instilled by the Adeptus Mechanicus. 
When mankind rediscovered the feudal domains of the knightly houses, they quickly found common cause exchanging oaths of loyalty. Many knightly houses see the Imperium as their equal partner and participate in it in its militarily out of mutual advantage, says Jarvis. Although these houses trade openly with the Imperium and march to war alongside their armies, they retain a fierce independence. Other houses found common cause specifically with the Adeptus Mechanicus, who in turn courted the knightly houses with unseemingly ignor eagerness, says Jarvis. These Adeptus Mechanicus-aligned houses, as they are now known, have forged alliances of reciprocal protection and betterment. Those who look at the fealty of the knightly houses towards the Adeptus Mechanicus often wonder as to whether the relationship is not in fact based on jealousy. For the priests of Mars covet the pre-imperial technology that lie within the mighty citadels of each knightly house. For their part, the Mechanicus-aligned houses seem not to care, since they receive the full resources of the forge worlds from their allies. While the overwhelming majority of imperial knights belong to houses, some are unable to maintain their palace, says Jarvis. These are known as free blades. <laughs> Whether they have been dishonored, shunned by their peers, or perhaps can simply no longer abide the drudgery of courtly life, these either scout out on their own, wandering the stars in search of a worthy cause, or else they settle in further isolation, offering their protection to those who need it. These distinct types of imperial knights provide rich opportunities for collectors. Jarvis concludes, there is simply so much choice available that hobbyists are free to explore the Imperial Knights to their heart's content. We look forward to seeing what they create. Boom. And that is the fluff slash interviews slash histories of the Imperial Knights. Enjoy!